The League of Revolutionaries for New America would like to thank Peterbilt Productions for sharing this video that explains the basic truth about production in the workplace. It presents a picture of freedom where technology is used to meet the needs of all the people in a sustainable way, not the needs of a few billionaires. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Brown. I, I am an instructor here at Laney College Machine Technology and I'd like to welcome you to this workshop. Just about anyone is going to agree that we're in a major economic crisis and it's worldwide. Everybody is, knows that by now. And um, down here on the ground we're certainly beginning to feel it, where, whatever part of this society you're in. Uh, and there's lots of information and discussion on how it came about and all the ins and outs, lots of programs about why this happened, how it happened, all the details, and lots of apologies from s corporate CEOs, from presidents, from legislators um, for this terribly surprising mistake. But it's not a mistake and a lot of Americans understand that it's not a real, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise to those of us who have been watching it develop for years. Uh, it's more like chickens coming home to roost. First, let's start with how things used to be made. This is an Oakland machine shop. The shot was taken in 1931, but I like it because it's really beautiful. But what I want you to notice is that every machine tool in here has a person attending it. One machine, one person, okay? Those machines don't do anything that the person running them doesn't tell them to do. And when I hired on at Caterpillar Tractor in 1971, much more modern machines, but that's basically the way it was. One person running one machine. 1,600 people in one shop, three shifts, running hundreds and hundreds of machine tools. One person, one machine. Right now, I'd like to get real. So put on your safety glasses. I'll be turning this aluminum bar stock into this part. It has screw threads, it has a hole, it has a radius, a curve, and uh, aluminum's nice and soft, we can go nice and fast. First cut's always a facing cut. So I faced off the end, gives a clean surface. This is a repetitive act. That is, I make one pass, I go back to exactly the same place, and I take another pass deeper. Each pass cuts the thread a little bit deeper and a little bit more completely. Throwing a starting hole.
14 minutes. So, notice that everything the machine did, I had to make it do. I had to change the gears, set the feeds in motion. These are great machines. They're really powerful. Uh, I can remove five pounds of steel in less than a minute. So next, we're going to go in this room and make another part that's almost identical to this. So what we have here is in the same family of machines as what you saw me running. It's a lathe. They call them turning centers now, but it works the same way. It has a spindle and a chuck which holds a, a workpiece and that spins and the cutting tools which are mounted in a turret are moved into contact with that workpiece. This is a CNC machine. CNC means computer numerical control. This is controlled by this computer and this program was in this case written by hand, just typing on the keys here. And it's a fairly rudimentary program, but complex programs are written by point and click where you can draw a three-dimensional object on the computer with keystrokes and, and mouse clicks. Are you ready? Shall we time this? We had 14 minutes, right? Yeah. Are you ready? First it does a facing cut, and then it enters what we call a roughing cycle. Works like this. So now it's doing the final outline, and it's going to do it again. That's going to drill us a hole. Notice how fast the, the tool changes are. Here's the threading, watch this, 700 RPM. The computer knows exactly where it began and where it ended, so it can always go back to the same point and relocate the thread for each successive pass. There are, there are uh, lathes and milling machines that have magazines of 150 tools including spares, so when one tool goes dull, it reaches its expected life, it automatically changes it out. Okay, okay. cycle Who finish. Who timed it? Who timed? Four minutes. Four minutes. So, the difference in time is obvious. From 14 minutes down to, what was it, four and a half? Okay, that's obvious. But what, what other differences do you notice? I'm sorry? Don't have to pay you. That's right. I wasn't involved. So, we looked at how things always used to be made manually, and we looked at how they're being made today, but it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, and let's start off with a video clip quickly. Micah, can you run the first clip? This is a Honda factory. This is real. The bodies are set down on fixtures, and the robots dance in together welding the bodies and assembling parts. But as you can see, there are no humans involved. This is a reality. And I have two more uh, short video clips to show you about how that reality gets done. Both of these video clips take place in the Haas machine tool factory, and as it pans over, you'll see a machine here, a machine there, a machine there. Each of these is a manufacturing cell. It is self-sufficient. An industrial robot picks up a 40-pound steel blank, gracefully puts it into a large CNC lathe. This is making parts for Haas machine tools. So it's Haas machine tools making Haas machine tools. It takes the semi-finished blank out, reverses it, watch this, comes up under it, puts it in the second machine, which does the second operation. They're not showing you the machining. Removes a finished pulley and deposits it on a pallet, which will be taken away by a robotic loader. Okay. So this is a completely self-sufficient unit that requires no attention except very occasionally. The Haas factory not only has these machines, but they have a pallet bay that's bigger than this wall that is loaded with pallets like that. 
okay, four or five deep, ceiling to floor, the whole wall. So they used workers to attach the parts to these pallets, and then they set the machines running, and then they leave. The machines just run. The machines are programmed to use a cutting tool for its expected wear life and then change it for a backup tool. Okay, that's all in the program. They use the term lights out manufacturing. So lights out doesn't mean they make you work in the dark. It means they start it up, they turn out the lights and they go away. Okay, they need a small number of skilled people to program the machines and to set them up a small number of unskilled workers to load the parts onto the pallets. They do not need the hordes of workers anymore. Uh, what's the question? So I'm wondering, since all this stuff is computerized, couldn't you, like technically, the people who are doing the programs, couldn't they do it over a network? Couldn't they, like... Okay, Sevi's asking a good question. Since this is all computerized, couldn't they do it over a network? You mean like an x-ray technician in India reads your x-ray? that was emailed yeah, to her. If it's just like a program text file, yeah. upload yes. to the server. These programs can be written in Baltimore or Mumbai and sent here directly to the machine tool if they want. So um, <laughs> this brings us to a term that we've all heard lots before, productivity. <laughs> now, most people I run into think productivity is how hard you work. We Americans are the hardest working people on earth. We're the most productive. Well, we are very productive, but productivity is not about working hard. There's a very small range within which you can drive a human worker before they start to get sick, fail, tear things up, die, okay, die have accidents. Um, and so that range is limited. Productivity is how many hours of human labor go into making a thing, okay? And what we just saw is a good example. I'm gonna give you a more graphic example. I spent 14 minutes on that part, and then we did it in four and a half minutes. 14 minutes, that's what, four an hour? Four and a half minutes, let's say five minutes, that's 12 an hour. This is a part I got at a machine tool show. It's stainless steel, it's actually a medical part don't ask me what it's for, I don't know. I saw it made. I watched it be made. The guy that came out of the machine, he handed it to me. And I estimate I could make this part in nine hours. I'm totally guessing, I haven't tried. But nine hours on a manual lathe, okay? Who would like to guess how long this part took? Sevy? Minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes? 10, 10 minutes, 20 minutes? This took 90 seconds from solid stainless steel bar stock to finish, 90 seconds. So, nine hours, one and a half minutes. Somebody can do the math, but we're talking hundreds of times faster. Hundreds of times faster. So, the amount, uh, and there was nobody standing there looking at it. These machines are all over the place, and it takes up less room than the machine I just showed you. Of course, it's you know a hundred and twenty thousand dollar machine, but nobody has to run it, and its productivity is incredible. So now we're going to show how productivity was a boon, and now is a disaster for the economy we live in. Uh, some factories are virtually empty most of the time, but they're running full bore, and. You know, we hear a lot about how jobs have gone overseas, but less than 25% of the jobs we've lost in the United States have gone to other countries. The rest are simply gone into or due to automation. Going for cheaper labor is a step on the path to automation. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Yeah. So let's, let's get into that and why it's so profound. First, we're gonna talk about the real economy and we're gonna talk about it as it affects us in three ways, people, value, and profits, okay? First, let's, let's talk about why you shouldn't be, as, be scared of economics, okay? Um, the economy is not all these derivatives and fancy financial tools. The real economy is how we produce and distribute the things we use. That's the real economy, okay? That's the economy on which all these financial instruments parasitize, okay? So, 
Um, this is also called circulation. And anyone can understand this. And it's really important that all of us be able to describe this to our fellow people. Because who else is talking about it? Is anyone talking about this? No. no. Now, we have a system that's called various things. I'm calling it a corporate market commodity system. Corporate means that most, thing, most, most manufacturing is done by corporations. Okay. A commodity, who knows what a commodity is? A product, like a cell phone. What's, what's special about that that makes it a commodity? You can sell it for money. Ah, <laughs> it's made to be sold. A commodity is something that's made to be sold. So it could also be an apple. Or it could be anything. It can be your ability to work. Where are commodities bought and sold? They're bought and sold in a market. And the market can be a store or a nation or the world. We have a global market now. Okay, So we have a corporate market commodity system. And um, productivity in that market system was continually goes up. In other words, there's a continuous process of growing efficiency where it takes less and less time, as we illustrated to ourselves, to produce something. It used to be that they required lots of people to do this work. And now they don't require lots of people. And this is what we're going to get into next. We're going to look at our economic cycle. And to do that, I'm going to have you folks draw our economic cycle. Somebody pick an element of our economic cycle. Say something. Uh, labor? OK. Uh, let's call labor workers. Uh, put that somewhere. Um, do the workers just do everything? Who buys the products? Who are the consumers? They're the workers. So draw an arrow straight across the circle from, from workers to products. Really nicely done, everybody. OK. So let's go back. This is our fundamental economic cycle. Factories are owned by corporations. Most workers work for corporations, whether it's a, a, a big food chain or a manufacturing company or a conglomerate. You're working for a corporation mostly. The corporation owns the factory, hires the workers. The workers run the machines that make the products, and then those products are sold essentially to the workers. So the workers are the ones who buy these. And they're sold in a marketplace for money. Someone was asking about where's the money? Money exchange. And the, the, the money paid for those uh, pays the costs of production. And the rest is profits that go to the corporation. So what are the laws of this system? this corporate market commodity system. Well, first of all, and these, this is an actual law in writing, OK? It's a US law. It's in the laws of many countries. The corporation or the owner is bound by law to, provide max, to seek out maximum profit for the shareholders. That is above all else. And it's also a law in the sense that the law of gravity is a law. Second law. The system and the company will not support anything it can't use for profit. Now, the profit might come down the road a little bit, but if it, if it doesn't see a way that it's going to grow or increase its market share or improve its position, it's not going to use it. And that includes educating people. Third, everything is for sale. Everything's a commodity, whether it's human labor of various sorts or things or services. Finally. Reducing labor costs is mandatory. Labor costs are the huge variable for uh, manufacturers. Okay? When you buy a machine, you're buying already used up labor. In other words, all the work that got done to build that machine is already in it, and you're paying for it when you buy the machine. People are both the means and the obstacle to the manufacturer's success at the same time. Okay, And built into this system is what we call a business cycle. You've heard that. This cycle is real. They overproduce because they have to produce enough to capture the market. 
to sell to everybody because they have to try and capture the market from their competitors. They overproduce and then they shut down because they've got extra product that they haven't sold and they lay people off until those goods are sold and then when those goods are sold they return to production. This has been going on for hundreds of years. It happens regularly. Just since 1975, there's half a dozen of them. Okay? Um, that's a regular cycle that corrects itself. It hurts people, but then it puts people back to work. Okay? It's never fair, but it works. That's part of this. But when something new is introduced that disrupts this cycle permanently, then it enters what's called by some people a general crisis. Okay? This is a crisis that's not going to correct itself. So what happens when something new is introduced here? Well, to, to understand that, we're going to turn ourselves into a factory. When Vicki and I teach this in the public schools, we, uh, the fifth graders really like to make it a shoe factory because they like cool shoes. So let's make ourselves a shoe factory real quick. Um, I'm going to divide you into arbitrary groups. The front row runs the machines that make the sole. Okay? This group over here runs the machine that makes the uppers. Oh, we need a volunteer to be the owner. <laughs> oh, I've got three. How shall I decide? I don't know. I think I'm going to make Vicky the owner. <laughs> okay. So, she, oh, yes. Okay. No. But I promised we would do this without meanness. No. You care about your workers. And I say that without a snicker because we have to be able to describe this by the way the system works before we talk about human behavior, okay? Because the system is what's the problem here? Okay, so you're all running the machines. Vicki pays you fairly. She treats you fairly. She actually cares about you. <coughs> she feels a connection with you, and you make good shoes. Suddenly, machinery becomes available that is guided and controlled by computers completely. Suddenly, Vicki has a serious choice to make because the other shoe factory across town has bought those machines. They have fired all their workers. They didn't lay them off like they're going to come back to work. They fired them because they no longer have need for workers. And they're producing shoes for, let's say, half the cost. And that means they can sell them cheaper than Vicky's company. Is Vicky going to be able to sell shoes? Shake your heads no. So she has to come to you with a question. She says, not really a question, she says, I have a bad choice to make. I can either get rid of you and buy these machines, or I can ask you to work for less so we can sell shoes cheaper and compete in the market. This is real. Now, I've worked for companies who lied about that through their teeth all the time, but this is real. She has to compete, or she will be out of business, and you'll be out of a job. Okay. So suddenly, she either has workers making less or no workers at all. What happens to this cycle? We have a rupture. We have a rupture in the cycle, a rupture, a break. And is this a temporary break in the cycle, like the cycle of overproduction? No. no. This is a permanent, fundamental, rock-bottom, rock-solid break. This same thing is not just happening in manufacturing, okay? The same year the CNC machines started to come in the door, they were automating phone operators, and they were automating bank tellers. All the service industries are going through the same thing. Science, laboratory chemical mixing is being done by automated machines. Not everywhere, but it's being done. It can all be done. And the designers who program these robots, and because these are robots, are using robotic computer programs like SolidWorks where you point and click and it draws a circle. Is this just a problem for the workers? It's a problem for Vicky, too. Because if the workers can't buy the stuff, can't buy the shoes, she can't circulate her commodities. One half of the world's population doesn't make enough money to participate in this cycle at all. They can't buy, $2 a day doesn't buy any commodities. Okay? And one billion of them, approximately one-sixth of the world's population, are literally starving. 
slowly or quickly, and I'm not raising this as a tearjerker or as a moral question. We could talk about that also, but I'm raising it as a feature of this. Commodities cannot be circulated fast enough to make up for how fast they're made. There aren't enough people making enough money to buy what's being made. And that takes us into the next subject, value. What happens to the value of a product when there's, yes, the value of youth? It goes down, yes. Well, why does it go down? Well, you have to ask what value is. What is value? Where does it come from? What? Time of labor. You're talking Adam Smith. Adam Smith, one of the great uh, theoreticians of the capitalist system and the, the, one of the first people to actually describe how it worked, was the first person to describe the labor theory of value, that human labor is the only source of value. But there are different kinds of value, and we have to be clear about what kind of value we're talking about. Use value. That's why we really need things. You value this chair because you'd be standing on your feet without it. We value our home. We value our food. We value our loved ones. Emotional values are just the same as any other use value. They're important to human life in some way. Okay? We're not talking about use value today. Use value is and has been a reality for humans, and it will continue to be the fundamental kind of value. We're talking about this other kind, exchange value the value that only commodities have, things that are bought and sold. So when we talk about value and exchange value and how human labor is the only source of exchange value, what happens as we eliminate human labor from the product of production of things? Does a thing that involves no human labor or so little that the cycle is broken have any value? Do Vicky's products, because she owns these shoes once you've made them, do Vicky's products have any value in the marketplace if they can't be sold? Is there a marketplace? No. A marketplace is not a thing. It can best be described as the steam and the action of the way it works. The people buying and selling, the place is just where they do it. It's easy to get confused between exchange value and prices, which are not the same thing. As exchange value is undercut, it is not necessarily reflected in lower prices. Prices vary above and below value due to many market conditions, kind of like how waves and troughs vary above and below sea level. This includes maintenance of prices through corporate techniques listed later. Capital has a powerful interest in keeping prices high but sometimes actually cuts prices for market or political purposes. The clearest illustration of destruction of exchange value is shown by the destruction of value and price of the one commodity, the most fundamental commodity, which capitalists have no interest in keeping high, human labor. Elimination of labor from other commodities has unhinged pricing, made it difficult or impossible to rationally set prices, but the price of labor, all labor, is being undercut by destruction of exchange value. With few exceptions, wages globally are stagnant or dropping. Remember that the one-tenth percent are not paid wages for their labor. Their wealth and income is rising because they're paid for their ownership of all of the corporate wealth through stocks, hedge funds, etc. So the key to why capitalism can't solve the problems robotic production causes lies in this. The very relationship that makes the system work is being eliminated. This is why we can only solve this problem by making all corporate private property public property and bringing government and the state apparatus under control of the 99.9%, .9 the working class. Let's go now to profit. Where does profit come from? It's kind of a mystery in our society. Profit is called by some surplus value, which is unpaid labor. How does that happen? These workers, when they run these machines, there's a cost to the workers. They're paid enough after, in six hours of work to pay for their cost of living, that is raising a family, having a house, 
It only takes six hours of work, for instance, to pay the cost of that worker staying alive, raising a family, buying their kids' shoes, etc. But they work for eight hours. The other two hours of value that they create, the other two hours worth of shoes, goes to the owner, and that's called surplus value. That's where profits come from. That is the only source of profits other than thievery. We'll be getting to that in a minute. It's not quite thievery because the workers agreed to work for that wage and they agreed to work for eight hours, okay? But it is, in fact, unpaid labor. What happens to profits when value decreases? Since profits are part of value, surplus value, exchange value, value, as you decrease the amount of human labor and value goes down, what happens to profits? Profits from manufacturing go down. How, how would you maintain profits and price in this situation? What can a manufacturer do? What can Vicky do to maintain this system as the value goes down and the implication of profits goes down. What can you use? Any ideas? Louder. Cut labor costs. Yeah, well, that's what they're doing. Yes, they're continually cutting labor costs. Catherine said, explore other markets. Okay, yes. Go to a different country. Go to a different country, that cuts your labor costs. Make a cheaper product. Make a cheaper product and sell it for the same. Now. The problem is, and this is one of the reasons why value decreases, while just Vicky and the other company across town automated, they could sell their product for more because this other company, the third company, was still making it with workers. They could make a profit by selling it lower. But when the, all the companies automate, that's the new cost of production. Buy out the other companies and monopolize the market. There you go. <laughs> Buy out the other companies and monopolize the market, then you can sell it for whatever you want. Get too big to fail. Oh, you can get too big to fail. Yes. Because these are these are self-reliant companies. Finally, you can seek other sources of maximum profit. And those include education, health care, the military, utilities, resources. So uh, we see the rise of speculation. What's the difference between speculation and anything else? Investment is putting money into something in the expectation of a return. Productive investment, that is investment in things that create value, is connected in some way to manufacturing and circulating goods. Speculative investment creates no value. So if you buy a house, the person who loaned you the money is actually helping circulate that commodity. Okay, that's a productive investment. But that mortgage doesn't sit in the bank. The bank sells a dozen or a hundred of those to a mortgage broker who bundles them up with lots of other mortgages into an unidentifiable mass and sells it to a group of investors which may have what's called a black box corporation because nobody knows anything about what it does. And all they care about is that these things make money. We're seeing the rise of wildly speculative investment which has actually supplanted productive investment. In other words, productive investment used to be the vast majority of investment and speculation was the small amount. That, in, that, that was so in 1970. Now, 2005, when I saw this statistic, it is exactly reversed. Productive investment is the vast minority, uh, and it shows in a company like General Motors, which is now mainly a financial corporation. So let's talk about from now forward. Let's ask ourselves if this is broken, and value has reduced to the point where commodities can't be circulated and we can't have what we need because after all, what is the purpose of all this? 
What is the purpose of all these manufacturers, all these corporations? What's it for? What do we have a society for? We have a society so that we can live together in community. The only reason to have a society is for the needs of the people in it. That's simple logic. Okay. If the entire world is in economic crisis and nobody's making any money, and the, the idea that we would freak out over that is absurd because money not being there doesn't mean, you know, all the workers are still there, all the factories are still there, all the soil is still there, all the seeds are still there. Everything is still there. The money just isn't there. We're still capable of working. Okay. We're still yeah. capable of eating. Okay. There's really plenty of everything. That was the point I was trying to make. Thank you. We can deal with pollution, which we could talk about as climate change. We could go on and on. We can do huge amounts, and we're going to have to do huge amounts in order to save ourselves from the destruction that we're beginning to see. It's time to conclude. I really hope you've enjoyed this. I really have. And Um, I want you to know that I'm extremely optimistic because I believe that we can do this. We're in a tough spot, but we Americans have an important role to play in this change. We are the only political support of the most powerful rulers in the world. When they lose us, they've lost it all. We're at a turning point in our human history. and. We need to educate and pre prepare ourselves to take decisive action and focus our organizations on getting us all into the driver's seat because we don't have our hands on the steering wheel of this country. That's why we're not the ruling class. The potential of humans, of the human race, has not yet been touched. We haven't had a chance to show what we can do. Not a chance. And when we make this transition, we will find out what humans are capable of together. If we can end this constant scrabbling for profits, power, and personal advantage, these are really petty things. These are really petty. We have the opportunity to show what people can do when we're working together to help each other live in the world, not to dominate it or each other. That's it. Thank you.